Hello and welcome to History 391. This is the class scheduled for the Friday of the second last week. Um, but I've decided this is going to be the last video. Um, we can do Zoom sessions and such next week if you'd like, particularly if you have discussions ahead of the final assignment. But you know, I think that we've kind of, we've given it our best shot here. Um, and and I hope I hope that it's, I hope the semester has worked out as well as it possibly could have for you. Um, it's not too late, especially with the, the last paper being due this week and with a final assignment to come. Even if you haven't reached out to me all semester, you're always welcome to do that. Um, I hope that you do. Um, and if you have any interest in, you know, reaching out just in general, even after the class is over, you know, you know how to find me. I'm easy to find. That Zoom account isn't going anywhere. So I thought I'd kind of end today with a, a, a bit of a kind of a lecture style thing, talking a little bit more about Vietnam in the 1980s and um, also trying to sum up just a little bit some of the ideas behind the class. I think that there's three questions I'd like you to be asking yourself um, now that we're coming to the end of this, the end of the whole term. Um, and questions that we, I think we were attacking really the whole term. How do we construct a history of Vietnam that takes wars with foreign powers into account? And what I mean by that is, how do we construct a history of Vietnam that takes these wars into account, but doesn't let those wars be definitive of the Vietnamese experience? Doesn't simply make Vietnam the site of these wars, the first and second, you know, Vietnam War or Indochina War or whatever. Um, this is why the naming is important. You'll have noticed this term that some, some historians prefer to call them the Indochinese Wars. Some professors call them the Vietnam Wars. As you've noticed, I tend to kind of go for first Indochinese War and then the American War in Vietnam. Why is that important? Well, it's important because it really factors into how you're trying to kind of give Vietnam a chance to be located um, in its own kind of, a, you know, as its own thing. At the same time, this class spent a lot of time thinking about um, and talking about and reading about and watching American reactions and American digestion and American experience of not just the war, but the fallout of the war and what that meant for American confidence and everything else. And that's always been an important part of this class. Um, and the extent to which, you know, the American experience relegates a Vietnamese experience to a subset of the American experience or, you know, an aspect of the American experience. The, these are, you're not going to solve these by the time the final assignment comes in, but these are questions I, I'd really like you to be thinking about because I think it raises, I know that it raises larger questions about how the United States interacts with the world. And also as historians for us to think of what is Vietnam's position? In the world? How do we think of Vietnam? Is it just a small helpless country in Southeast Asia? Like, you know, how does that work? And then in turn, how has the world affected Vietnam? There's this major question I touched upon in a previous video, or I, you know, talking about what happens in Vietnam after the fall of Saigon going to the late 1970s. The short version is they invade Kampuchea and have a fight with the, with the Chinese. The Chinese invade Vietnam. But, you know, 75 is the fall of Saigon, 76 is the official reunification of the country. And this should have been the great apotheosis, the great kind of signal, single defining moment of Vietnamese nationalism. And, you know, was it that? You know, what motivates so many millions of Vietnamese to leave the country and to, con to continue to leave the country into the 1980s? And um, once the U.S. leaves, what are the Vietnamese left with? They're left with a country that's been torn apart by war, a country that, which has these communists are coming in from the north, who, um, who have very clear ideas of how to rebuild the economy. And unfortunately for the Vietnamese people, those ideas proved to be um, either the ideas or the implementation of the ideas, or frankly, in my opinion, both, proved to be very limited and proved to just not be enough for Vietnam and lead to more and more economic hardship. Um, you know, nationalism, does not, do, is the national goal achieved with reunification? Are we now done? Or should nationalism be creating a prosperous, healthy, safe, vibrant, exciting Vietnam in the Vietnamese case or Ireland or United States, whatever, whatever nationalism means to you. So what does that, what does that mean for Vietnam? We know, and to repeat some information from previous video, that the collectivist uh, policies, many would call them Stalinist policies, uh, really hold sway in Vietnam in the late 1970s. Le Duan, our friend from the NLF, um, and arranging Vietnamese communists in the South throughout the war. Um, he effectively takes control of the party and controls the party until his death in 1986. Um, the attempt to create kind of, you know, publicly held land in all agricultural areas of South Vietnam, which had been done in North Vietnam, and it resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands. We're not sure how many died, um, either through because they resisted or they identified as landlords or just because they were seen as enemies of the state or whatever the case might be. We know that in the South, two million um, Southern Vietnamese were relocated as a result of these 
um, collective, you know, collective policies, collectivist policies, I should say. Um, one of the challenges the Vietnamese had was that it is a small country and so its industrial production footprint was fairly limited and certainly there's a concern that the Vietnamese Communist Party underestimated the challenges that would emerge in trying to apply these collectivist ideas to such a small place. Now, collectivization didn't magically work in China and Russia either. I mean, my God, in China, it leads to a man-made famine that kills at least 25 million people. It's a, it's a stunning humanitarian disaster in China. So it's not like they're perfect in these larger countries, but Vietnam does seem to have evidence that it, it's pretty tough to make them work in these smaller countries. I mean, at least with kind of the tone and with you know, at least with the tone and, 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 and or with the, the particular style and this kind of approach. I mean, there's lots of examples of land reform working in a place like Taiwan, where at first glance, it looks very similar to what the Vietnamese are trying to do. But in effect, you don't have the same kind of, for one thing, you don't have the bend towards public ownership. You have a bend towards shifting private ownership. And there's important differences there. As a result, the economic crises in South Vietnam well, all of Vietnam, of course, but southern Vietnam has this, you know, radical kind of, you know, collapse um, of economic output. Leads to horrific problems for the Vietnamese government. And they basically, their economy starts to completely collapse. They're entirely reliant on the Russians and the Eastern Europeans because of ongoing rivalries and problems with the Chinese. Um, and as a result, uh, their economy has, you know, major, major problems. They make the massively radical shift to, to equitization, the idea of allowing equity to come into the economy. Um, in effect, you know, by 1986, when Le Duan passes away, they're importing rice to keep their population alive and keep their population fed. They have massive inflation of prices. Um, the state-owned enterprises, which are these large companies that are owned by the government, are just completely ineffective and are not generating any kind of reasonable economic production whatsoever. And so effectively they make massive changes, they're called the Dui Mui um, uh, reforms, which are effectively to allow and create the possibility of foreign investment and to make foreign investment more likely. And this is actually part of a global trend in the 1980s. The Vietnamese are following the Soviets who brought, who brought in Glasnost and Perestroika in an attempt to reform both their political system and their economic system. And in China, the Chinese are going through very serious economic reforms, effectively proto-capitalist reforms of the 1980s, which, have, which led directly to the China that you guys have grown up with and the China that we see today, which is very, very powerful regional power um, in, in, to no small, for no small part, in no small part due to its major, major economic power an economic footprint. So things changed radically for Vietnam as the 1980s went on and of course Glasnost and Perestroika in the Soviet Union also led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, although there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and the kind of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the falling of the the fall of the Iron Curtain in Europe removes this kind of these allies that the Vietnamese have. Of course, the Vietnamese economy is changing. The Chinese economy is changing. Leadership is changing. Chairman Mao had died in 1976. Le Duan dies in 1986. There's all these different reasons that the, the, the binary Cold War order is over um, and Vietnam is kind of coming into kind of its own. Uh, Vietnam in many ways has lots of similarities to China today, for example, where it's a quote unquote socialist market system. There's kind of lots of complexity to that. A north and south divide remains in Vietnamese economic production, um, but you've seen this gradual emergence of kind of a, an urban middle class and particularly, funnily enough, the importance of Ho Chi Minh City, the city formerly known as Saigon. In fact, I was watching a John Oliver clip recently about coronavirus that was featuring this um, this video of to keep your hands clean and stuff out of Vietnam, which is a great example of V-pop, which is similar to K-pop, Korea pop, and J-pop, Japan pop, which um, is, you know, shows that Vietnam has a budding middle class which supports social media and, you know, lots of pop music, electronically produced and everything else um, that you're seeing in lots of other places. Also, Vietnam's relationship with um, China remains extremely, extremely complicated. So in the last year or two, more and more Southeast Asian nations are expressing concerns with the Chinese and with Chinese aggression and coronavirus hasn't helped that. Um, but long before that, the Vietnamese and the Chinese had quite a difficult and complex um, relationship. Theoretically, the Vietnamese should be picking, piggybacking on the Chinese and their large labor pool and their, the, the massive economic benefits of dealing with the Chinese. But that has not always been something that has landed well with the Vietnamese public. Um, you know, 
sometimes old relationships um, persist and are difficult to reform. Finally, you know, so this class talked about the US a lot as well as Vietnam. Vietnam's relationship with the US has become kind of fascinating in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. You're seeing American dignitaries go back to Vietnam. You're also seeing, you know, you know, regular American civilians, uh, veterans, former servicemen, going back to Vietnam, going back to the places where they had served. There's just these, there's a, fa you know, time heals all wounds, they say. Um, certainly for your generation, I'm sure it's kind of, you hear Vietnam, you know the Vietnam War was a thing. Um, for most of you, I won't say all of you, for most of you, it's just another Asian country, right? Where you had, America had this kind of complex past. And so that's kind of, um, that's a fascinating thing. I think it makes it easier to approach the questions I listed out at the start of the video. Um, you know, what is Vietnam's place in the world? How can we think about a Vietnamese experience that is Vietnamese? But also, you know, the reason this class spends so much time talking about American reaction to Vietnam is I think it is important. Most of this, most of you guys in the class are American. I think it's important to look at not just the way the United States interacted with this country, but also how the United States processed that interaction and narrativized it and developed it and thought about it and repackaged it. And what does that do for when you hear that word Vietnam? Maybe the only thing you know about it is the war. You don't know about, I don't know, Vietnamese pop. Maybe you don't know Vietnamese cuisine or, or what have you. And that is always going to create a challenge. So one of my, one of the ideas that I had, you know, making the class years ago was um, that, you know, listen, I, I cannot get past the reality that, that, that people have these hurdles. I mean, I have these hurdles myself. How do I, how do I engage with Vietnamese history without thinking about, you know, the Chuck Norris movies from the 80s that I grew up with? Um, so I decided to make it a part of the class. And I like talking about Rambo. And I'm really sorry we didn't get to hang out in class watch Rambo movies together. But, you know, we can always do it next year. Just we do a social club, if you like. Chuck Norris and Sylvester Sloan movies. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, thanks for a great semester. I must say um, I was nervous when we went online. Certainly I wasn't happy about it. I don't know a single faculty member who's happy about it. I know it's been a big challenge for you. And I want you to know that um, I appreciate the effort you put in. And I'm proud of you. Um, and I'm grateful to you if you continue to take it seriously. I know this has been tough. I know that some of you have been through a very, very tough time. And I know it's been scary for all of us, but you know, we're going to be okay. And um, we're going to stick with it. Um, seniors, come back and say hi to us. And for the rest of you, I'll see you in the fall. Um, I'll see you next year and we'll, we'll get this taken care of. All right, on a more mundane note, come find me on Zoom, okay? And um, I'm happy to chat about assignments and the like. Um, until next time, thanks for watching.